What's up everyone? This is Darius Kalbarczy, co-founder of Inchi Poland, JS Poland, AngularMaster.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to the JavaScript Master Podcast. Today, together with Mishko Hevry, who is a CTO at Build.io, creator of Quick, Angular, AngularJS, and co-creator of Karma.js, we will talk about resumability versus hydration. Can you elaborate the difference between resumability versus hydration? Yeah. So there is a resumable and hydration is a topic that people love to argue over on Twitter endlessly, specifically with me, right? And so a lot of people, uh, their argument goes like this. Hydration is the process of making the application interactive. Uh, um, in your case, you are making the application interactive and therefore you're doing hydration. End of story, Quick does hydration, right? Uh, Quick's case, Quick's argument is a little different, which is, uh, yeah, we are making the application interactive, but the mechanism by which we're doing it is so fundamentally different, and it has such significantly different performance characteristics that we should just call it something else. It's no longer the same thing, right? Um and I think you can think of it this way. Like we all know that a bicycle is not the same thing as a car, right? Uh, they have very different purposes, right? But if you kind of look at it on a higher enough level, they are all modes of transportation, right? And so you could argue like, why are you creating two different names for these things? They're all modes of transportation and we should just call them vehicles, right? They're both vehicles. You're not wrong on this particular topic, but I think... You know, a lot of people will uh, see the great value in saying, well, no, no, I need a separate name for a car and a separate name for a, for a bicycle. Because while, yes, they're all getting me from point A to B, they're doing it in a very different way. And there are very different constraints with it, right? So if I want to take my family with me, I'm not taking a bicycle. <laughs> uh, if I want to go far, I am not taking a bicycle, Right. If I want to do something for fun, I may take a bicycle. And so well, the argument that I have is, look, the stuff is so fundamentally different that calling it hydration is just, um, it, it misses the point. And so then you can go kind of further and you can kind of subdivide it. And then people will say, well, yeah, but we have lazy hydration, hydration of islands and um you know all of these progressive or I don't know what all the fancy names are today. Uh, of it. And so my argument there is, look, in all of these cases, you are still doing the same exact thing. We're really just arguing about both the order in which you're doing it and when you are doing it, right? And uh, in some cases, we are, you know, saying like, hey, this stuff is static and therefore it never needs to hydrate at all. So you can create, you know, this is the island uh, uh, thing of Astral. And so you just don't need to do hydration on these components. So we basically have extra knowledge that tells us actually hydration is unnecessary here because we know there is no interactivity. Uh, but the process by which we make it interactive is the same exact process. We're just kind of debating about when it happens and whether it should happen altogether or should be spread across uh, many different uh, kind of points in time um, in a system. Right. Whereas if you look at how reasonability works, it, it fundamentally doesn't do a whole bunch of things. Right. And I think that's kind of the the big thing is that when you have an application, let's say you have a dashboard and the dashboard is interactive, you need to somehow attach the listeners. Right. And you could do it all eagerly at the beginning or you can uh, do it in parts. You can prioritize different things. You can do it on mouse over, mouse hover. You know, but you're still doing it. And what I'm saying doing it, it means that you're executing a whole bunch of code to make it interactive. The way reasonability works is that it's all just attributes in a DOM and there is nothing to do, right? The, the act of putting the attribute in the DOM is all you need to be able to interact with it. So there is no make it interactive step. Right? That's the first difference. The second difference is 
how exactly do you get a hold of things, right? So at the end of the day, uh, before you can click on a button, you need to get a hold of its event listener because you have to attach the event listener to the DOM somehow, either through add event listener or through some uh, event delegation system or, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, details. At the end of the day, you have to get hold of the closure of the listener before you can attack, before the button gets interactive. If you do not get a hold of that closure, the button cannot be interactive, right? And uh, most people don't think about it, but creation of closure is expensive in the sense that it's not that making a closure is expensive. It's all the stuff that had to happen so that you can make the closure, right? The actual act of making the closure is very, very cheap, but the closure uh, assumes that the code has already parsed and executed, right? So it has all of these this cost that we don't associate with making a closure, but it is there, right? And the other thing is that the closure closes over uh, variables. So for example, if you have a counter, the closure closes over the state of the counter. And that state of the counter is usually a set method, right? So if you push the button to increment it, that set method internally has to close over the fact that there is some state associated with the value currently. There is also some DOM elements that I have to update in order to do this. There is also some framework references I have internally so that I will notify the system of updating. It might be that this value gets passed to child components, which means now I have to have references internally about this child components as well. None of that stuff is things that people think about, but it is the thing that is implicitly inside of this closure, right? And so making these closures is an expensive proposition because what it means is that you have to execute the application starting from the root component and visit every single child component that's currently in the render tree and look at its listeners. And if you find a listener, you have to instantiate a closure for that listener and then attach it to the DOM in some mechanism, right? And the... the uh, the attach the, the instantiation of the closure implicitly has the cost of parsing the code, downloading the code, executing the framework, creating these closed over things like setter methods and so on that you don't think about, but it's all kind of in there. The thing about reasonability is that reasonability has none of those things. The first thing that is a big difference in reasonability is that you don't have to have a closure before you set up a listener for the DOM, right? The Causality is reversed over there. In normal systems, you have to have the closure that closes over all of your state, and only then can you attach it to the DOM listener. In resumable systems, you say this is clickable, but no closure actually gets attached. So you can have something that can process your click before any code gets attached. Okay, so that's kind of the first big difference. The causality is different. Like the closure gets created when the click is actually happening, not before. And that's a, that's a huge difference, right? Now, it would be extremely expensive, as it, essentially it would be as expensive as hydration to create the closures by starting at the root element and visiting everything, right? And so uh, resumability is about turning things around. And so oh, the, the other big thing to kind of understand about resumability is that resumability needs to be able to import the the listener that's associated with that click button, right? So if you have the click listener, you need to be able to import it. If you look at existing systems, there is no way to import a closure that's buried deep somewhere inside of your template, right? There is nothing you can import to get a hold of that thing, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, you most of the times, you cannot even import the component that it's inside of, right? Typically, you have to go to the root component and the only way for you to get a hold of a closure that's buried deep somewhere is to literally execute the code. And as the code is executing, it will pass the closure instance to you, right? So in the reasonability, this thing is totally upside down. To kind of put it differently, in, in the normal system, there is exactly one entry point, which is your root component, 
right? That there's one entry point to your whole application. Now, let's say your application has a thousand different buttons on it, and each button does something different, right? Um, you have to start executing the whole thing. And as you're executing the whole application, you collect these closures, right? Resolubility says, no, 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 no. I need to have an import to each one of these, uh, these button behaviors, right? And so the first thing you have to solve is you have to have thousand import, importable symbols. And if you think about it, normal applications that are hydration based have exactly one way to get the application started. The way you get it started is you say hydrate this root component, right? Whereas um, there's mobility systems have as many entry points as there are ways to interact with the system. So if you have thousand buttons, you have to have thousand different things that can be symbolically imported in some way. And it also means that if I'm interacting with button A, I am not interacting with the other 99 buttons. So I don't need to either instantiate or download or do whatever else with those 99 other buttons, right? And um, that's kind of the, the, the magic of resumability is that by you have to refactor the code in some other way so that you have these top level uh, imports. Now, it turns out once you have these top level imports, you can do all kinds of other things like you can do lazy loading and speculative fetching and like all this other magic, right? But that's a secondary thing. That's a side effect of the fact that reasonability requires that each possible way of interacting with the application is a different entry point. And fundamentally, that is not how existing applications are written. The existing applications are written with this idea that there is a single root entry point, and then everything else is just some closure buried deep down somewhere that does not have an exportable system. Now, this is a good DX, like the way existing systems are written, that's a very good DX. So asking people to put every single listener into a separate importable symbol, nobody would do this, right? Like th this is a non-starter, like, yeah, it's nice that you have such a nice performance, but yeah, no, I am not putting every single listener into a separate um, importable symbol. That's too much work. And so you need to have some other mechanism by which you do this. In other words, you need to allow people to write their code in the way that they're used to, in the DX that they're used to, uh, but then uh, spit out the code, like the, the output of the code has to be in these top level importable symbols. And this is what the dollar sign is. And if you think about it, you know, in the past, we really talked about this, this dollar sign saying like, oh, this is a lazy loaded boundary. That's, that's one way to think about it. But from a reasonability point of view, the better way to think about it is every time you see a dollar sign, that may be the initial place of entry for the system, right? Normally, when, he, when you run the application, the main method, there is one way to get the application started. What it is in the reasonable systems is that every time you see a dollar sign, it is a potential place where the, the start of the application may begin at. And so you need to design a system in this really interesting way where any one of those things that are the beginning or the, the starting point of execution is the place where the application can get in its correct state so that it behaves the same. So it doesn't matter whether I click with the button A first or button B first or uh, you know have an invisible task go first. It doesn't matter which one of those happens first the behavior application has to be consistent. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, a hard trick to do. And the way you solve that is through recovering of the state of the system. So you need to serialize the state and you need to recover the state. Um, but that's kind of the super long-winded way of saying like why I don't think it's fair to define uh, hydration as make your app interactive because um, you get in the world where it is so fundamentally different uh, it, it, you know, it just begs a different term because if we have the same term, then we are really not communicating to ourselves uh, just how fundamentally different this is. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, language, the purpose of language is to communicate and to get ideas across, right? And so uh, the, the t coining of a new term is a way for me to, to tell you like, yes, I'm making the app interactive, but I'm doing it in a fundamental 
completely very, very different way that has very different consequences to the performance of the application, to the mental model, to how you build it, et cetera, right? And so for that reason, I think the separate term is required. Just like we have a separate word for car and a vehicle, I'm sorry, car and a bicycle, and almost nobody ever uses the word vehicle because it's too broad and like, while technically they're correct, uh, it is not useful. How does this apply to large applications? Um, it's the same thing, just extended to the larger application, right? And so the the larger the application, the more of an advantage reasonability gets. Because if you think about it, if you have a very large application, there is no way that you can run hydration in in any reasonable amount of time that, uh, you know, if you do it lazily on click, right, there is just no way that you can do hydration uh, in a way that it, that, that it wouldn't annoy the user, right? A hydration on a large scale app can take seconds, right? And so it's just not a thing to do. And so this is the reason why everybody fundamentally does hydration eagerly because you want to pay that cost as soon as possible. But it also means that there is this dead space, right? Like before hydration completes, clicking on stuff, you're just clicking into the void, right? Nobody's listening on the other side because the system doesn't even know if it should listen, right? And so there's this this uncanny valley of death where like it looks like the application is up and running. You click on stuff, nothing happens because hydration hasn't done its job. And so it doesn't even know whether it should listen for that click listener or not. So hydration um, it can be extremely expensive, especially for large-scale applications, right? Whereas uh, resumability is uh, very inexpensive, or like the, the core premise of resumability is that it is so quick to recover the state and execute the piece of code that uh, you can do it lazily, right? And so if you need to start at the root component and go through the tree, way too expensive, right? But if you can just import the operation that is sitting behind the, the button, right? So if there is a add to shopping cart button, if you just import that exact code directly that's associated with that button, well, then it's no big deal. You can just execute it uh, essentially lazily, right? Like you could just get it in there. The only thing you have to make sure is that uh, that piece of code is it's already sitting in the cache, so you're not paying for the network latency, right? And provided that you can make sure that the code is sitting in the cache, and we have prefetching for that, et cetera, uh, the, the retrieval from the cache and then putting it inside of the V8 to execute is uh, extremely cheap, cheap. However, there is a cost of deserializing the state, right? The first time you interact with the system, you are deserializing the state of the system. And so that is obviously proportional to just how much state the application has. Quick is very good about being able to tree shake the unnecessary uh, state of the system, uh, but nevertheless, it's it's, it's going to be proportional to some degree uh, with the you know the, the the amount of state that has to be deserialized. Um, but it turns out that you need to get your state of the system pretty ridiculously large uh, before JSON.parse becomes a performance bottleneck. Right, so the only difference between a first click in a resumable application and a subsequent click on the resumable application is so if you have two buttons, button A and button B, both require you to you know be, it, it's a code that has never run before, right? So button A loads its data from the cache, button B loads its uh, function, you know, the JavaScript from the cache, but they have the same exact execution code path except for the first button had to do an extra step. And the extra step was json.parse. So technically, the first time you interact with the system, it is slightly slower as the second time you interact with the system. Uh, but json.parse is so fast that um, even on super large data sets of megabytes, uh, we're talking you know, deeply sub-zero, like maybe 100 milliseconds or something like that, uh, in terms of the cost that is required to, to get there. And then if you have to send so much data to the client, you know, you might have other problems, but uh, there are ways to kind of break the data into smaller subset through containers, advanced topic, we don't have to go through it. 
Uh, but there's basically hacks once your application gets so ridiculously large. But I'm going to argue that if the same exact application was to do hydration, the problem would be magnitudes worse, right? Because if you have so much data that you're sending across and the application is so complicated, then hydration will be, you know, orders of magnitude worse problem than the than problem of JSON.parse. Because if you think about it, the hydration also has to recover the data somehow, right? So somewhere deep down in the bowels of hydration is also a JSON.parse for the same exact data set, right? So uh, hydration has to do everything resumability does and much, much, much more. So this is why resumability always wins. Like there, it is, I can't think of a scenario uh, where hydration would have a faster performance than resumability because in each case, at the bare minimum, hydration does what resumability does. And then on top of that, it does tons of other things. What about running the same code twice? Actually, I should have talked, mentioned this earlier. The other way to kind of look at the difference in hydration and reasonability is let's have a simple component called the counter. And in the counter component, we say console.log render counter, right? And then the counter set up, sets up a state and sets up a button and prints the state and then the button does the, the incrementer, right? So as simple as you can possibly imagine. Okay, now when you're pre-rendering the button on a server, you will see the log show up on a screen. We'll say console.log, right? It will say uh, render uh, counter. And then when uh, hydration uh, runs on a client, it again will re-execute the thing. And if you look at the log in the, in the, in the UI, it will say console.log uh, render counter. Now, if you look at the HTML, it will probably say something like current count is whatever. That string current count is going to be duplicated because it's going to be in the HTML, but also it's going to be in JavaScript that is associated with the thing that renders uh, the the value, you know? And maybe uh, in addition to counter, let's say it will have a name in there, like Darek. And so uh, the Darek will be there twice too. It will be once in the HTML, and then again, somewhere in a JSON that basically says, oh, by the way, the state of the system contains you know, this name and this name is Darek, right? So no matter how you slice it, there's this duplication happening where uh, the code executes twice, once on a server, once on a client, and then everything is delivered to you doubly so, once in the form of HTML and once either in the form of JavaScript or in the form of data. And so you have this duplication going on. And so fundamentally what reasonability is about is kind of recognizing that there's all this duplication and we want to get rid of this duplication, right? Every single string should be uh, downloaded exactly once, okay? So uh, the, the first thing you're going to notice with reasonability is that on a server, it will say, you know, uh, render counter, right? That's no different. The, the behavior on a server will have to be fundamentally the same because on a server, it is the first time you're running the application and you you have no choice but to start at the root of the application and then go through the tree. Uh, but the, the the thing you're going to notice is that the uh, render counters console log will not appear in the client. And because it will not appear in the client, that's because it never ran on the client. So the first thing you can do now is you can remove that piece of code. You don't longer have to download this, right? So if your bundler is smart enough, the bundler says, ah, you know, if if the entry point to my application is the root component, then from the root component, I can eventually get to my counter and therefore the counter has to be included. But if the entry to the system is not the root component, but instead the entry to the system is the click listener associated with the counter, then from the click listener, there is no code path which will get you to the um, the counter itself. And because of that, the counter doesn't get uh, have to be downloaded. So now, now you have successfully managed to not download the same structure in both the HTML format and then again in whatever the component format you happen to have, right? So you've deduplicated that. But you still have the problem of Darek, right? So you have this name Darek in there. It's not in the in the in the JavaScript, but it is inside of the the data that represents the system. And so you need to serialize the state of the system into the JSON. And so the direct would be both inside of the HTML and also inside of the JSON. Except there you can make a very simple trick and you can say like, hey, 
you know, the string that goes in here is the same string as over there in the HTML. And so the only thing you actually have to do over there is when you're deserializing this JSON to say like the string that goes here is the same string that's already in the HTML. So, so you dedupe that particular part as well. And so as a result, like the goal that really reasonability has is this property that you should not be sending anything twice, right? You either send it in the HTML form or you send it in the JavaScript form, but never twice, right? So a behavior for a click listener, that is not in the HTML. So that you need to send in the form of JavaScript. Um, but the structure, what the counter component looks like is already in the HTML. So then why are you again sending it in the form of uh, JavaScript in it. So there's duplication, right? So, so reasonability is all about like this aggressive deduplication, both in terms of the execution, but also in terms of downloading stuff, uh, it, it, both in terms of JavaScript, but also in terms of data, right? Like in all cases, we're just trying to dedupe stuff uh, so that we don't have to send things twice. We don't have to execute things twice and so on, right? Now, if you think about how a click listener is described, in all the systems, uh, let's pick React as an example, the, 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 the listener is inlined inside of the JSX. And because it's inlined inside of the JSX, there is no way for you to get the listener without getting the whole component, right? So the two are coupled. And this is why Quick with Resume Mobility says, no, 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 you need to put that listener somewhere else, but nobody wants to do that. It's a lot of work. So instead, Quick provides a special dollar sign that basically says this thing here, is a potential entry point. And therefore, I want you to do all of the magic that's required to deal with that. The consequence of all this magic is that that piece of code gets pulled out, it gets hoisted into a separate file. And now the bundler is like, oh, you need the thing that increments the code. No code path from the counter leads to the component itself. Component itself can be tree shaken away and throw away, right? But because things are clumped together in other frameworks, this clumping causes the bundler to kind of not be able to, you know, not send things to you because everything is just too close together. And there's just no, you know, the only thing the bundler can do basically is send everything. Mishka, thank you so much for today's conversation. Meeting with you is always a great pleasure. There is so much viable knowledge and positive energy. So I'll see you in less than two weeks at the workshops and NG Poland and JS Poland conferences. Yeah.